Hey folks, Sam Luce here. Thanks so much for checking the video out. When I say thanks, I mean thank you. Yeah, you. Today I want to take a look at the Shure SM7B. This is more than just a look. It's going to be more than an in-depth look. It's going to be probably the most in-depthiest look anyone's ever done. Probably. People will say about this mic things like, well it sounds great. Yeah, it's really directional so you don't have to worry too much about room treatment. Or it's not got much gain. But to me, nobody ever really says everything about this mic. They never discuss the ins, the outs, the beginnings, the origins, the reason why it has the features it does, why it looks the way it does, and importantly, why it sounds the way it does. So that's what we're going to do here. This is as close to a complete dissection of the SM7B as I can possibly get. We'll do the full history, we'll do some sound samples, we'll try and dispel a few myths about whether or not it has enough gain. It's going to be an absolute nerd fest. I can't wait. Let's get stuck in. Firstly, the thing you need to think about when you're looking at the SM7B or even the 57 or 58 is that these microphones are just some in the latest and extremely long list of Shure's SM line. The SM stands for Studio Microphone. Just in around 1964 alone, when Shure debuted the SM5, which we're going to discuss in a moment, they also released the SM33, the SM64, a long list of other microphones, all in just this one short period. Some of these were cardioid, some omnidirectional, some ribbon. There really was a massive variety available. So Shure are more than just a company that releases rugged, cardioid dynamic microphones that can stand being thrown around the stage. The microphones that we know and love today, the 57, 58 and the SM7B, are the result of a great number of years of trial and improvement. Not necessarily trial and error, because I don't think any of these mics were ever really said to be bad, but there was definitely some refinement that went on here, and Shaw moved with the times. They were aware of what studio engineers wanted at the time, and how things were moving away from a few valve mics in a room. Remember it was around 1967, the same kind of period of time that we're talking about here, that the Beatles started to move away from ambient mics and move towards close mics on drums. This was a transition period of moving away from just big expensive mics that needed to be handled with white gloves and starting to think about microphones as more of a utility instrument. So it all started with the SM5. This was released in 1964. It was originally designed as a lightweight boom microphone for radio, TV and film. There was the SM5A and the SM5B, the only difference being the output impedance. Now I'm not going to go into that too much right now, but suffice to say it was more or less just intended for different desk inputs, depending on what people were using it for. They would use one or the other. One of the selling points of this mic was that it was really directional. It had excellent projection from the sides, pretty similar to what a lot of people love the SM7B for. Another similarity to the SM7B was present in the SM5C, which came out a few years later. It had a 100Hz low cut. Now the low cut on the SM7B is actually pretty interesting, because it starts all the way up at 300 and something hertz, which is not massively common. Typically the point at which you say a roll off starts from is where it's 3dB down. So it's not the frequency at which it starts to come down, it's the point at which it's 3dB below where it started can't remember why. But this is 3 dB down at like 350 hertz, so the low cut is actually pretty high. This is the microphone flat with no EQ boosts or cuts as you've been hearing it so far throughout the video. Here's the microphone with the low cut engaged, just taking out all of those low frequencies. Here's the microphone with the mid boost engaged. This is intended to help the vocal cut through a dense mix. And here's the microphone with the mid boost engaged and with the low cut engaged as well. The form factor of the SM7B as we know it today is pretty familiar. It's been basically the same since the original SM7 50 odd years ago, but the SM5 was very different. The SM7B is 189.7mm or 7.5 inches. The SM5 was around 10 inches, so although it's billed as being lightweight, it was a pretty big thing. You'd have no chance of holding the mic like you see vocalists doing in studios today, but for good reason. Nobody was using it for solo vocals. I think the thing you have to remember is that in 1960 something you have a lot of rules in music and in recording. You have the blokes in the brown coats who are the ones allowed to set up the microphones. If you're not wearing a brown coat, you don't touch the microphones. You've got a microphone that's for recording dialogue on a set, the SM5. You don't record anything else with it. Why? Because those are the rules. I think now there's more free reign over stuff like that. A broadcast mic can easily become a lead vocal mic just by someone buying it and using it on a lead vocal. You don't have to write a letter to the owner of the studio to ask permission, you know? So that was the SM5, or the SM5s. There were three of them, A, B and C. They were basically used for doing dialogue on film sets and stuff like that. Not really a whole lot to do with music, more about speech. Fast forward a few years to 1973 and we had the release of the original Shure SM7. 
So the original SM7, just SM7, no letters after it, was initially just believed to be a decent broadcast mic, used by radio presenters, stuff like that. There's really a lot of thanks to be given here to Bruce Sweden and Quincy Jones, who famously recorded most of Michael Jackson's vocal on Thriller with this mic. Legend has it Bruce bought one of his first SM7s in 77, 1977, and was supposedly one of the first engineers to use it for musical means. Obviously it was a few years later, in 1982, when Thriller was released, so he had a few years to get used to it. He's perhaps not the only one to use it, or the first one for studio vocals, but he's the most noted. So the SM57, SM58 and SM7B and a load of other Shure microphones use the famous Unidyne 3 technology. They don't all use the same capsule, but they use capsules that have the same origins. I just want to say that now. There's a massive amount of conjecture about whether the 57 and 58 are indeed the same mic with a different grill. I'm not going to get into that right now. Suffice to say the 57, the 58 and the SM7B are all derived from the exact same origins, the Unidyne 3 capsule, and are adaptations upon that technology. So they came from essentially the same starting point. Then the designs kind of spur off from there. Talking strictly about the electrical design of the SM7 and its ancestors, it's got no transformer, whereas the SM57 and 58 do. So this is in part why it sounds different, and it's also a contributing factor to why it has lower output. A transformer is often used in circuits to boost the output. The caption in the SM7 is also a decent amount larger than in the 57 and 58. Remember, it's based on the same capsule, but not necessarily the exact same. It's an adaptation on the same technology. The biggest difference being, in the case of the SM7B, the actual size of the microphone. If you look at the mic without the foam shield on the end, we're going to discuss foam shields shortly, not as boring as it sounds, I promise. But anyway, you can look at the mic without the foam shield, you'll see that the actual capsule is a fair distance away from the end of the microphone. So even when you see vocalists right up against the grill, or the foam if it's on, they're actually a couple of inches away from the capsule itself, far closer in fact than they would be if they were on a 58. What that means is that the proximity effect you usually associate with being right up to the grill is actually not present in the SM7B as much as you might think. This helps shape the tone of the mic a bit. It means you can actually add a load of that radio presenter low end to a vocal and it's not going to be really muddy. Now the thing everyone always tells you about the SM7B is that the output is really low. And yeah, it is low. You're going to need a decent amount of gain from your preamp to get this up to a good level without introducing a load of noise. There are a few products on the market that combat this by providing a phantom powered inline boost, which will provide some clean gain to bring up the level of the mic. The two most noted examples of these are the Triton Audio Fethead, which is actually the one I use daily with this mic, and the Cloud Lifter. I think the Cloud Lifter is now probably the most common of the two, but I kind of prefer the Fethead, just because in a pinch you can actually plug it straight into the mic itself and not have to worry about the additional cable like you do with the Cloud Lifter. Both of these come in various different configurations. The FET head has versions that allow phantom power to pass, some that block it from going any further, which is useful for a safety net for ribbon microphones. The Cloud Lifter also has a stereo version, which is cool for podcasters or anyone who's using two SM7Bs at once. I want to give you a comparison of the two boosting circuits here, and also one without any kind of boost, so we can get a feel for how much gain you're actually going to need if you don't have a booster. Here's the Shure SM7B, going through a cloud lifter to give it a bit of an extra boost. Here's the Shure SM7B recorded through a Triton Audio FET head to give it an inline boost. Here's the Shure SM7B just going straight into the preamp. This is an Audion ID44 preamp with no additional inline boost. Now the output of the SM7s in general has always been low. The SM7B is low, the SM7A is low, and the SM7 original was low as well. This hasn't changed. But what has changed is what you get with the microphone. That's the thoroughly exciting aforementioned foam shield, and how susceptible the microphone is to interference as well. The original SM7, with no letters, had the same sound that we know and love today, but had the issue that it was quite prone to picking up interference. Now in 1973 this wasn't as much of an issue in studios, but by the time 1999 rolled around and we saw the release of the SM7A, computers were more prevalent in studios, and with computers came big fat CRT monitors that would cause issues with the microphones. That's why when the SM7A was released it was designed with an upgraded humbucking coil, which helped reduce that noise that could be introduced with its predecessor. In terms of physical appearance, the mic still looks more or less identical, 
whether you look at the SM7, the SM7A, or the SM7B, as long as you don't read the model number. The only real difference is that the actual mount, or the yoke, has changed between the SM7 and the SM7A, and then the changes stayed in the SM7B. On the SM7A and the B, the XLR connector is at the front of the mic, so closest to the person speaking into it. On the SM7, it was at the back. This is fine if it's on a regular floor standing microphone stand, but as soon as you put it onto a desktop boom arm like this, you soon realize that having the XLR on the back seriously limits the range of angles you can have the boom at. So a functional change that didn't alter the sound of the mic, but a welcome change nonetheless. You can, of course, change it round if you like. You just have to undo the screws and turn the microphone round. Now the elephant in the room with the SM7B is its rise in popularity in the last 10 years or so. As much as I'd love to say it's down to Michael Jackson, Anthony Kiedis, James Hetfield, or any of the singers who are seen to be using this mic, I think it's actually fair to say that the market has been influenced greatly by streamers and content creators. You see so many people using this mic when they're streaming or talking to camera. The popularity of this microphone, the newest SM7B, has absolutely skyrocketed. If you're watching this video, then you either own one and know how great it sounds, or maybe you're thinking about buying one and trying to justify the price tag. I think it's fair to say that in 2023, when I'm recording this video, there are far more things in a home studio setting that are going to stop you from getting a great vocal sound, more so than having a mic that doesn't have a massive amount of gain. Your room is probably going to be a pretty big issue, and using something like the SM7B is going to help you circumnavigate that issue somewhat, because as I mentioned, it's known for having that side and rear rejection. You're going to get far less sound with the room in your recording than if you're using a large diaphragm condenser, for example. So the Shure SM7B, it's a great mic for vocals. Lots of people use it on hi-hats as well, which seems a little ostentatious, but why not? It's such a great mic that Slate Audio emulated it. So you can get the sound of this mic along with the sound of far more expensive microphones whilst using their modeling mic, the ML1. It has a rich history. It's kind of a success story of the microphone that started as something very different, but through a long chain of people just experimenting and trying out new stuff, found that it sounds decent enough to record vocals on multi-million selling albums. But that's about as much as I know about it, about as much information as there is out there online, and hopefully about as much as you'll ever need to know about the evolution of the Shure SM7B. Although I'm sure there'll be someone in the comments who knows more. There usually is. I'll catch you next time. Take care. Thank you.